Welcome back, everybody, to the Fantasy Hockey Hacks podcast, a proud member of the Heavy Hockey Network. I'm Devin Davidson, your host. With me, as always, Bruce Gunther. Hello. And joining us for episode 126, we have a special guest tonight, uh, the managing editor for Dauber Hockey and uh, the man responsible for our weekly fantasy ramblings that we all love so much, Ian Gooding, and of course, no stranger to this show. So Ian, uh, welcome back. All right, glad to be back. Yeah. How, how's your summer been? Oh, not bad. It's, uh, you know, traveled around a little bit, um, went up to Kootenai National Park uh, near, near the Alberta border. Um, travel around a little bit as, as well. Didn't go too far, but, uh, you know, had, had a nice time anyway. Yeah. I've, I've seen a few photos of you and your, your kids and just, uh, looks like you've had some time to relax and get away from the game a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's, uh, yeah, summer has gone by quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Um, we've been busy. We kind of, I mean, we took a break ourselves, uh, back in, what was that? April Bruce, just at the end of the season and yeah, took some time away from the playoffs. Yeah. Apparently yeah. nobody cares about fantasy hockey between uh, <laughs> between April thirtieth and and June first kind of thing. I at least in our experience, you know, our, our listenership just seems to do other things, Bruce. So <laughs> yeah, so that was good. We actually it was it was really good for us to get some time away. Um, but we're excited. I'm I'm really excited actually for the start of the season here. Just you know, seeing all these updates now, Ian, uh, up in training camp and and getting real news again. Something current we can talk about is exciting. Yeah, it makes the ramblings easier to fill anyway with stuff happening and (laughs) the players and there's old line combinations. First day of training camp, people going crazy. Like, oh, so-and-so is on the line with, you know, it's like, oh, just just chill out, relax. First day, you know, they're just just trying some things out here. It's not going to, that's not what the line's going to look like all season here. Uh, Yeah, like William William Nylander on the third line center. (laughs) Holy cow, we're people losing their minds. Yeah, well, I just traded for William Nylander too. I I got him a fairly good deal for for him. So uh, you know, it's discouraging to see him if, if he actually ends up this way. But uh, you know, that's yeah. Well, we're all like a yeah. bunch of but dogs. We'll see what happens. Bone, they, right? they don't. You know, they're, they're not going to stay like that all year. No, I mean, no, no. Well, we have, tr- go ahead, Bruce. It could be Trilling's way to try to get the cap number down for the contract at the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Put him on the third line by himself. You know yeah, what? Yeah, it's going to be another another short uh, playoffs for the Leafs then. Yeah. Yeah. There's some truth to, to that, Bruce. We, we've seen it happen in Edmonton, right? They they kept Bouchard's yeah. number down or tried to. So, um, they tried to. But yeah, you're right, Ian. This is the time of year where you try these things. The games don't matter. Like, if you're going to tinker, now's the time to do it. And um, But it's, it's not going to stick. So, But we did talk about that last night with uh, with Blake Creamer, who's on the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, we talked about Gabe Velarde getting top line deployment in Winnipeg, and the fantasy hockey demise of of Nikolai Ehlers, uh, second Oof. line right wing. Like I just and and now again, he Dauber put that tweet out said he he tweaked something and he's not gonna he's kind of just taking some time here the next couple of days. Like I am mm-hmm. I am so beyond over Nikolai Ehlers for a number yeah. of reasons. Um, <laughs> I'm putting him on my do not draft list. I'm done. <laughs> He's way down on my draft list. I mean, it's every year. Then the injuries too, on top of that. Yeah. You know, he's been, I think he's average. I was going to put this in a rambling soon here, but he's averaged 50 some odd games the past two seasons. Like there's some serious injury concerns, you know, and on, on top of that, there's always that tease of why isn't he on the first power play for Winnipeg and then for years. And I tweeted something out and the Winnipeg writer, Ken Weave actually tweeted back at me and said, he actually, he actually messaged me back and said, Hey, look, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's he's not on the first unit power play because him and Shifley want to play in the same spot and they, they give it to Shifley. So, yeah, you know, like, you know, and, you know, and when they read that, OK, well, it's like he's not really going anywhere then. That's, you know, that that's going to be how it is. And I, I, I said I said to people like, hey, look, this is how it's going to be for Ehlers. So, mm-hmm. you know, just, you know, just, just quit getting your hopes up about him. <laughs> you think at a certain point, if you're Nick Ehlers, you would just be amenable to I'll play somewhere else on the power play. Like they, I just don't think they have enough elite level talent at this point on that roster for him to say, well, I'm going to play in this position or no position at all. Like, you know, move around a little bit, be, be adaptable, be flexible. Um, I mean, at the very least for my fantasy roster, help me out here. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Floating forward. Oh yeah. Uh, what else did we find out today? Uh, Seth Jarvis, Seth Jarvis, um, 
and again, this is super early, Ian, but we're all just dying to talk about something new. Uh, Seth Jarvis on the top power play unit for the Carolina Hurricanes, along with both Brent Burns and uh, Tony D'Angelo. So we're, we're all curious how that was going to play out. I think Bruce and I were thinking, if you're bringing in Tony D'Angelo to play in Carolina, he's probably going to be on the first unit power play. The question was, will Burns be there too? And it looks like, at least for now, he's going to be. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I kind of thought Burns would have the upper hand, but at the same time, you're not bringing in D'Angelo. That's his strength. That's his number one strength. You can you can list out some glaring weaknesses for D'Angelo, um, but uh, you know the one strength he has is is the power play. So I think you're really not getting the most out of him if you're going to put him on the second unit. I mean, having said that, Carolina's second unit I don't think is a massive drop off from their first one either. Right. And if they uh, kind of divvy up their time almost evenly like some of them do, it might not be such a big deal. But again, um, you know, some of these team setups now. Um, we've gotten so used to the four forward, one defenseman power play. Some of the ways these, these teams are set up now, um, it makes it might actually more, make more sense to have three forwards and, and two defensemen, just because you have two puck moving defensemen, and uh, um, and they could they could be an asset for you on 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 that power play. Well, and, and these new defensemen, I mean, they're they're offensively minded, they're offensively skilled. They're not they're not defensemen of old that just we're stay at home defensemen, right? Like they have the ability to move the puck around, yeah. like you said, and, and score some goals. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you have it, why yeah. not use it? Yeah. I mean, every, you know, the, the old sort of, you know, it was the Rod Langway, you know, prototype stay at home, you know, you could have sort of a Paul coffee, the odd time with, you know, that had some wheels, but you know, yep. I'm dating myself with those references perhaps, <laughs> but you know, um, there's more and more teams are finding out more and more that to have, defensemen that are that are mobile not every defenseman has to be on on your on your squad you can have some you can have a pairing with a a mobile defenseman and a a stay at home and it works fine um but um but we can't we can't underestimate the 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 mobile defenseman anymore even if they lack size and even during that that time period the stay at home defenseman it was always teams were always trying to draft bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger defensemen now that doesn't matter so much anymore no, not at all. We've seen plenty of, of smaller defensemen make a, a big impact. I mean, Kale McCarr is not a big man, and I think he's the unquestioned number one defenseman, at least for fantasy purposes in the NHL. And you'd probably say overall too, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we're, we're having some fun just chatting, but I should mention tonight we're going to talk about uh, our top 10 centers and wingers. Uh, this is based on Yahoo ADP rankings, but we're going to go through some project- projections with Ian. He's going to give us some thoughts on each of those players. Uh, we're going to get into general draft strategy, and we've got some mailbag questions that uh, we talked about last night. Just wanted to get your opinion on those ones as well. So, uh, with that, Ian, let's let's talk some draft strategy first because we're it's just it's that time of year. Here we are, September twenty first. Um, seems like a good time to just w- what's going down in mock drafts that you've been a part of. Um, so I want to get pick your brain on that, uh, and starting with what are some of your personal favorite fantasy hockey resources to get ready for the upcoming season so websites fantasy guides uh, writers wh- whatever like what what do you rely on when you get ready for the season i would say the combination of the fantasy guide and fantasy hockey geek i i think geek is underrated because every league is different in terms of its stat categories um i play in one league that has all the multi-category hits block shots um, goals, assists, power play points, and so on. And I play in another league that's mostly scoring. And you can't use the same ranking sheet. It's not a one-size-fits-all. So, And that's where the geek comes in. It'll, it'll give you projections on each of those um, categories that you have and then be able to create a custom ranking system based on the scoring projections. I mean, I'll, I'll come clean. I don't do my own projections, not for every player anyway. Um, but... I will sort of look at, I'll use, say, Dauber's projections from the fantasy guide and then sort of, okay, there's going to be a few, you know, I, I, I can go with some of these. There's a few that I um, I might disagree with, like he uses Connor Bedard projection is quite high and I respect that for choosing that. I, I just go, um, I just wouldn't be quite as aggressive uh, for a rookie, but, you know, I... From there, at least by combining those two, I think that's when you get the best, um, the most targeted 
ranking sheet that you that you have. So I, I would say those two. And of course, don't forget about frozen tools. Um, looking stuff out there all the time. I have it constantly open when I'm uh, writing the ramblings because believe me, I don't have all these stats memorized that I <laughs> that I list out, but I do need them to um, prove any points that I make. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love frozen tools. Bruce will tell you I spend more time on there than I'd, I'd care to admit. Um, I was actually chatting with Dauber a couple weeks ago just through, I think it was Instagram. And because of mm-hmm. course the goalie post app came out, and I think that's a that's a fantastic app. I'm really excited to see how that works in season. Lots of helpful information there. But I said, is there ever going to be a frozen tools app? And uh, he said that that may be in the works. He wasn't going to confirm it, but uh, mm-hmm. that's something maybe coming down the line. So, yeah, I love that site for sure. Uh, Natural Statric is another one that I I go to quite a bit. Um, lots of really great information there you can use. Um, I've actually got into Elite Prospects this year just because I'm now playing in a, a dynasty league with Victor Nuno. And okay. I've never really been a dynasty guy, right? Like um, season long redraft, Bruce, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's what we really enjoy yeah. doing. And uh, so playing with some people that actually know what they're talking about when it comes to dynasty and prospects, uh, I had to jump into that. And then, of course, too, I, I do have the, the Dauber prospect report, which is another great tool. So um, I, I'm going to pick your brain on, on rookies because you had mentioned Connor Bedard. Uh, mm-hmm. we've got him projected Bruce for, what is it? 40 goals and 70 points, roughly. Um, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I, I just think like looking at Connor Bedard, he has already what many have considered an, an elite release at the NHL level. Like he is, he's, people are comparing him already to Austin Matthews in terms of his release. Um, and that may be a bit premature, but if he can get open space and time, is that is that too rich for you? Like, where where would you kind of see him finishing? I know it's tough with rookies, and, and they don't always pan out in the first year, but you look at a guy like Connor McDavid. Um, Austin Matthews had a great rookie season. Like, there's lots of players that have come to the league and done it. Uh, what do you mm-hmm. think for Connor Bedard this year? Um, I mean, my original sort of gut projection was 60 points, but I would um, I think that's a very uh, um, cautious well, I think that's a very cautious projection. I think you can kind of go close to a point per game, uh, maybe around 75 points. Is what I'm hoping. I mean, I do have Bedard on one team, so I'm hoping, uh, you know, I'm hoping Dauber's right on this one. His projection is like 90 points on on him. Wow. I, I don't think I'd go wow. quite as high. Um, it's you know, McDavid. I think was a point per game player in his his rookie season. Um, I, I would say right now, I would say Bedard is not quite on the level of um, of McDavid, but he could be a little higher than somebody like Matthews. Um, some of the other uh, rookies that have come up um, very recently, um, you know, I mean, Sidney Crosby even, um, I, I think was also a point per game as well. So he could be, be very, very close to that. And the way he's, the way he's dominated at, at every level, I mean, the NHL is, is the highest level. So it's going to be, um, it won't quite be so easy for him, but I mean, the Hawks are going to just pretty well just let him run free because hey, what else is on their roster? There's really not too much else. So, <laughs> nope. so yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, I, I think you can't go, he's, he's not going to lead the league in scoring, at least not yet, but I, I there, there's going to be, you know, he, he's going to show something that we haven't seen from rookies in at least a few years. Yeah, he's he's a very interesting player for sure. I, the one thing about him is like, yeah, he doesn't have great boots. He doesn't have Connor McDavid speed or Nathan McKinnon speed, and that's. But he does play a, a bit of a tougher game. Like, just I, I think he's he's underrated for hits, which is a lot of people have sort of overlooked that. Um, but I, I do have concerns about him this year. Like, we've got him projected for forty two and seventy four points. That's what we had him at. So mm-hmm. we're, I think we're kind of on the same page there. But right now in Yahoo, and and take this for what it's worth, he's going on average at thirty six point six. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're taking them in the third round or the, you know, like fourth round. And uh, that for me, there's a lot of other players that are very proven and are playing on elite offensive teams right now. So yeah. there's a lot of risk tied to that pick, I think. Mm-hmm. But if you think about players that are being picked around that, you kind of get a sense of what they're they're going to do. It's a, sort of that great unknown, right? There's a higher risk reward. And I, I think in a single season league, I would probably let him fall before I grab him. I mean, if he's around, if, you know, if the top 50 comes up and, and I see him, then I, 
I think I would grab him. But if the ADP is 36, then I, I think I'd probably just let somebody else take him. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of where I'm at with him too. And I, because really, you had mentioned it, what else does he have in Chicago? Like it, if Taylor Hall gets injured, which is is definitely a possibility, um, there's not really a ton of offensive talent, proven offensive talent on that roster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but this is probably the strongest rookie class we've seen in a very long time. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting players. Adam Fantilli, you mentioned earlier, both him and Bedard, I think had seven points in their first two rookie prospect games. Uh, look mm -hmm. again, you take that for what it's worth because they are playing against guys who are, uh, they're not NHL players, regulars, but, uh, interesting to see. Does anyone else interest you in terms of rookies? And then two, how do you approach rookies year to year? Like, is that, do you wait until the last round? Is that just sort of a flyer for you or do you wait and try and pick them up off the waiver wire? How do you approach that year to year? I would say I don't specifically target them in the middle rounds of a single season draft. I might wait till late in late in the draft and kind of pick through, or there's some of the, you know, one of my leagues is kind of the 50 point guys that you're looking at and oh, which one is, which one stands out, which one could get to 55 or 60 perhaps. Um, so I think at that point I might say, you know what, I'm, you know, let, let's see what rookies out there. It paid off uh, during Pedersen's rookie season. I, I've used a really, I, um, I used a really late round pick on him in his rookie season. And uh, sure enough, I was able to flip him for Jack Eichel later in the year, which nice. was, uh, you know, kind of a nice <laughs> return on investment. Um, last year, I went, I went William Eklund and Philip Tomasino in the late rounds of my, uh, in my draft. And, you know, within two weeks, I dropped them both. So, yep. because they weren't playing in the NHL. So, you know, it, it sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't. So if you use a late round pick, then I think there's not too much. Those are the players that you're most likely to drop anyway. If somebody comes mm -hmm. along on the waiver wire, and says, hey, I've got to grab this player, then that's the most likely of who, who you're going to drop. So, um, you know, if, if the rookie isn't going to stick around or if you see that they're getting less than 10 minutes a game or something like that, coach has them buried on the fourth line or is just super cautious about playing them because their defensive game isn't up to par, then... You know, but, but you know, using Pedersen as an example of a, a few years ago, um, he was right in, you know, he was right used in the top line for the Canucks almost right away. The Sedins had retired the year before. So, I mean, that created a, a spot for him and they were pretty much a, a blank slate at that point in time. So, so they were, they were using him in a, in a scoring role right off the hop. So it was a good, good pick for me. So that, that's kind of what you got to look at is what sort of opportunity are they getting? And you got to, you know, if you're interested in rookie, then it's good to track them through training camp. How do they seem to be used? Like preseason games, it sometimes can be, sometimes can work, sometimes don't because mm -hmm. teams aren't using their full rosters in preseason games. So maybe later in the preseason, what is it? You know, what is it starting to look like? So, um, so I at best I would use a late round pick on a rookie unless it's a Bedard quality rookie. I I would wait till the later rounds and just hope that you strike gold. I, I like that approach. That makes a lot of sense to me because you're right. A lot of those players you do end up dropping those, those last few rounds anyway, um, quite often are just waiver wire fodder anyway. So um, speaking of rookies, I I'm actually really bullish on Adam Fantilli. I, I drafted him in my dynasty league and I just saw today he's playing at least for now. They've, they've started him on a line with Patrick Liney and, and I think that could be really intriguing those two together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he could make the, you could make the Columbus squad this year. I mean, we'd have to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, start him with your top player, see how he fits, see if he's, if he's NHL ready. And I, I think he could be. Yeah. Uh, okay. So going into your draft, what sort of, do you have a general strategy going into each one based on league settings? Do you just kind of, is it, are you reading the room? Um, are you just fluid? Is it kind of whoever falls to you, falls to you? Like, or, or do you target specific players and, and have, positional scarcity in mind round by round i used to target specific players um when i first few years of doing it but now i've kind of shifted to relative value um again just kind of reading the room seeing which pick sort of gives me the best potential value like first of all you've got to look at is this a player that's going to be around in the next round mm -hmm. um if i if i don't pick this player is somebody else going going to grab them um look at the other options um, around that player. Are there, 
you know, does there seem to be a lot of supply? For instance, if there's a lot of defensemen with the, about the same number of points projections, you might want to wait a round or two for picking a, a defenseman because one of them might be left. Um, if, uh, you know, if you see a, a score, likewise, if you saw a defenseman that looked head head and shoulders above the rest of the options there, then I've got that pick lined up and I'm hoping that nobody's going to grab them before, before I do that yeah. kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. That makes, that makes total sense to me. Uh, are there any players like, so are, are, I guess I'll ask you, are, are you a zero G guy? Cause we had Blake on last night, apples and Geno's right. We know where they stand mm-hmm. in terms of zero G. Uh, I've heard some, yeah. some zero D out there now. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, that's a thing now too. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, I just, this year there seems to be really good value on defensemen in sort of the mid level rounds. I'm like in the mock drafts yeah. I've done anyway. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. And is it going to wait until that, that time and it doesn't say that defensemen are easy to draft because they're not but it's surprising how many if you kind of get through one tier of defensemen and go oh there's nothing, nothing left here then you look through another tier and it's like hey there's some there was some some decent options um but yes i'm i'm a zero g guy i practice on on one of my teams um where and i think it makes the most sense when you have um least to lose in terms of your goaltending like in this particular league where i practice it i have um eight it's a points league it's not a categories league it's uh you have to get more points than your opponent in head to head and that's league points by that i mean league points um and i have 18 skaters which are forward and defense um gosh, sorry um yeah typically you could use you have 20 players you can play per week no more than three of them can be goalies um so i typically use two goalies and 18 skaters so what that means is i try to maximize because of the volatile nature of goalies i'll try to maximize what i get out of the 18 skaters and i'll go zero g on the goalies like right now my goalies uh my three top goalies on this team are billy huso phoenix copley and anton forsberg because I know that if I, and all I look for is just passable goaltending every week. I play matchups. I just look for, um, I just hope my goaltenders aren't going to get negative points and that's it. And um, I have a stack top nine on this team in terms of forwards. Um, I'm still kind of working on my defense, but um, you know, you're kind of in a slow draft right now with this. So long story, but um but i practice zero g in 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 this one particular league in the uh, single season league that i have um i'll have to wait and see there's a there's a top tier of goalies that's kind of going around the late second round early third round that i think um a lot of teams are going to be reaching for this year just because they seem to stand out as sort of the top five you maybe even go top six or top seven, but some of the few of those goalies might fall. So I, I tend to, yeah. Yeah. I think yes and no, I would practice zero G. I think it depends on the environment. Getting back to categories or if you had say, you know, four scoring categories and two goaltending categories and you're head to head, that's a pretty high proportion of goaltending categories. So I think right. you want to emphasize goaltending there, but if your league does not emphasize it as much, like I have one league where I think it's seven and three, then I think you can, you could use cars of a zero G approach. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, in terms of zero G then, like you said, Huso, I, I like Huso. I think he's going to be an effective option this year in Detroit. Like they're not, I think they're going to knock on the playoff door. Um, they've done enough there and they've got some talent that could make a difference, I think. Um, so he should, he should be a great option. But the other two you mentioned, Phoenix Copley and Anton Forsberg, again, nice options. Do you see how do you see those goaltending situations playing out then in in uh, um, L.A. And, and Ottawa? I think L.A. I think Copley could play more than uh, um, than Talbot just because of Talbot's injury history. And Copley was decent when he uh, sure when yep. he was put in. I mean, I guess he could just as well be sent to the minors. But um, but I, I just like him as a you know, he wasn't he was sort of league average when he played. And that's sort of all all I'm trying to target here. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's also an auction league, so I have to sort of, how I use my cap. I don't want to spend, you know, gobs of money on a goalie. Yep. And the other one, uh, Ottawa, I think Corpus Allo, they brought him in. You kind of look at the salary situation. You know, he's getting paid a lot more than Forsberg is. They brought him in for, I think it was a five, five year term. Correct me if I'm wrong. So they're obviously putting something on him and he's going to be the starter, but 
you also have to keep in mind that goalies are teams are looking, I think, at load management a bit more with their goalies. Like gone are the days of the, you know, 70 starts with guys like Martin Berdur and Mikri Kiprasov <laughs> and Roberto Luongo. That's not happening anymore. Um, you might see a few goalies that get up to 60, but that's it. Um, with a backup, with a 1A or a backup goalie, you could still get some pretty decent mileage and then it comes down to how good is the goalie and i think more importantly how good the goalie is how good is the team how likely is the team going to win because a lot of goalie stats i think are a function of the of the team in front of them particularly the defense uh, that's why i try not to get too heavily involved in how you know how exceptional as the goalie is because people used to talk about how great great a goalie john gibson is and i I'm, i don't disagree with that i think it's a, a fantastic goalie but the team in front of him just is not good when they couldn't defend then yeah. um that that really killed his numbers no and, and i agree with that that's how i approach it year to year too and, and so that's what we've talked about Ilya Sorokin versus um Shesterkin and and like Sat or yes um so Sorokin and, and Shesterkin excuse me and then two we, we talked at length Bruce about uh Vasilevsky and Ottinger and for me like i I, yeah. I, we, I think we all agreed that we like Ottinger more for next season Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially if you're in a league where it it does emphasize wins. If like we're in an ESPN yeah. league together, Bruce and I and Tyler, and it's five points for a goalie win. So and, yeah. and three points for a shutout. So if you're yeah. in, a, you know, you look at Dallas. They're statistically mm-hmm. they were you know top five or ten in I think every major category team wise yeah. uh, last season. So I I really like Ottinger, and I actually don't mind paying up. But you know, so you mentioned those five or six of the top there. Like, are you? Would you look at targeting a, a top goaltender like that in the right environment, uh, if if possible, like based on where you're drafting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's that might be why you prefer somebody like Ottinger over over Sorokin because Ottinger's going to get more wins. Um, I, I mean, the other side to that is that the Islanders, I think, play in a really locked down defensive system that it really works wonders for goalies which is why Sorokin is in that the Islanders are kind of a borderline playoff team they might not even make the playoffs this year but they're going to give Sorokin enough games where his numbers are going to be you know his, his numbers could be phenomenal at least his uh his save percentages and his goals against average so I think you've really got to look at what the how you rank them I think really depends on the the stats category in your league and what you tend to emphasize for sure uh, Bruce, yeah. Bruce, anything else on zero G you want to add? No, it doesn't. I've been using it actively now for what year, year, season and a half ish. Mm-hmm. And when one league, it worked really well. The other league, it didn't work quite, quite as well, but I think there was about four of us that were all doing the zero G thing. So they were all more aggressive than I was. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't okay. go too well on that side. So. But I, I like the zero GI for the one league. I got some great goaltending late and that helped me out through the season. Mm-hmm. So, Ian, I'll ask you, are there any zero G targets you're, you're focused on late in drafts right now? Like for me, the couple like Joseph wall, I think is a nice one. I think, uh, and only because I don't know if Sam Sonoff is going to play a ton of like, or he's had mm-hmm. in, issues with injury and inconsistent play. I don't think he's ever played more than 44 games in a season or 45 games in a season. I think there's a real chance Joseph Wall gets a chance at some point um, mm-hmm. to play some games. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a chance. I, I think he's starting to pick up some uh, in terms of popularity. I, I think there's, you know, the, the injuries you have to worry about with uh, with Samsonov a bit. Um, so, I mean, I think as a really late round flyer in sort of a, a deeper league, I think you could stash Joseph Wall. Um, I mean, you just look, I mean, I consider a zero G to be anybody with an ADP past 100. And I think, um, one that you could look at that could be falling way down because of the kind of year he had last year is Jacob Markstrom. Mm -hmm. Um, it depends how bad, you know, whether you think that one year is reflective of where he's going. Um, but I think the Calgary is probably better than what they played as last year. I think last year was, a disaster in a lot of levels. And I think the coaching change will, uh, will help them. Um, you know, Markstrom was getting obviously drafted too high last year. He was kind of drafted in that top tier and that second tier of goalies. But I think now that he's fallen to around, I don't know if he's got an ADP of something like 150 or something. That's where I'm kind of seeing him. 
um, I think there's a real opportunity to uh, to grab him. Um, another one might be, I mean, here in Vancouver, Thatcher Demko, um, who um, played very well. Once he came back from injury, he played extremely well. Um, he, uh, um, you know, if he can stay healthy, then I think um, he could be in for, for a better year. Um, so I think that's a, that's another one that you could uh, you could potentially pick. I think you just kind of look down the list and and see which ones are. I mean, I would say if Akira Schmidt makes the Devils, assuming they don't, uh, he doesn't get beaten out by Keith Kincaid for the backup job, then I think he could potentially <laughs> steal the job from um, yeah. from Vitek Vanacek. That's the way he played last year. So I think there's. You know, you look through there. There's plenty of options. There's a Logan Thompson even. You might think he's better than if you think he's better than Aiden Hill, then he might make some sense as well. So there's, I think there's plenty of options that you could just sort of roll the dice with on on zero G. Yeah, I, Aiden Hill and Logan Thompson, Bruce. I think those guys. If I'm going to look at one of them, I'm going to try and get them as a tandem late in the, And I think that's a great tandem if you can grab them at 150th overall, basically. Um, it's surprising me the guy like Pyotr Kochetkov in Carolina, like he's, he's still number three in Carolina. This, this is just mind blowing to me that people are drafting that guy ahead of Jacob Markstrom. Mm, it, yeah. it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah. And I think it might, you might even be the auto pickers in the Yahoo, uh, auto draft or the be, uh, mock drafts too, that might be picking him, keeping well be. him up or just people that don't, that see him ranked high and grab him and for all oh, they don't look fully look and see that Markstrom's below because as much as Kochetkov might be a, a good goalie prospect, prospect which he is, if he's third on the depth chart right now, I'm not I'm not touching him. No. Sorry, <laughs> only in a very deep league where I could I have room to stash him, but in a single season league, no, I'm uh, someone else can grab him for sure. No, I hundred yeah. percent. All right. Oh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Karel V. Melka. Like any, I, I think Arizona is going to be better this year. I, I don't know. Like, I don't expect them to make the playoffs, but I think that they're going to be uh, much more competitive than they have been. Like they've got a lot of great young talent there. Barrett Hayden, I think is going to have a good season. Logan Cooley um, could be a dark horse for the, the Calder. Um, you know, they just, I think they've got more regular NHL veterans on that squad and they should be better. So uh, Clayton Keller, obviously Nick Schmaltz, um, mm-hmm. so if Amelka has shown he can be a serviceable netminder on a terrible team, uh, mm-hmm. is he worth taking a look at late on a, an improved Arizona team? Yeah, I, I think so. I think he's, I think he's in that zero G category as well. I think Arizona is going to be better as I've been t- telling people, I don't think they're a playoff team. Um, I I'd, I'd say that that's a little bit aggressive as far as you get out of Arizona, but I think they're going to be better I'm looking at their roster, at least their top six. And, you know, there's pretty good you know, mix of, you know, sort of mid vet, you know, mid age veterans, like, you know, Clayton Keller and Nick Schmaltz. And, you know, you got, you you got Logan Cooley, Dylan Gunter coming in. So I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be an improved roster, um, you know, which, which will be good for a few wins. I think for Vegmelka, you don't kind of worry about him. I, I don't think Arizona is going to be like rock bottom in the league this year. So, which would make him a, a, a pretty decent option, I think. Um, and sort of in that mix, I wouldn't pay a ton of money or use a high pick on him, but, um, if you're looking in late rounds and I wouldn't hesitate to grab him. Yeah. He's going around 180. So I think for me, that's a guy that, you know, I picked him up off the waiver wire last year at times, just streamed him and he's been good. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's maybe move on from, from goaltending here. Then Bruce, um, what else did I want to talk to you about? I guess what what's the best selection in terms of value or performance that you have made over the past couple of seasons? Anyone come up to mind? I would say my best pick, and it was using zero G last year, was Linus Allmark. Because I was getting him in I got him around I inherited one team where I, I took over a keeper league team where he was on that team. Uh, but in another league I grabbed him around pick one hundred and twenty. I think it was pick 120, but it was definitely after pick 100. I know that. <laughs> and I won my goaltending categories every week by using deliberately staying on G, zero G and just hitting on the right guy. And I have to give credit because the Dauber guide, I think, had some good est- good numbers, positive numbers for him that I think um, were getting overlooked by a, a lot of other people. You know, I was thinking this really could be pretty good. Um, 
Yeah. You know, this year, I think he's, he's falling a bit in drafts because I don't think people are buying the fact that he's, um, you know, he's going to be a timeshare goalie with Swayman. And this was last season was by far his best season. And Boston isn't going to be nearly as good because Patrice Bergeron's retired and they lost a, a few players or their rentals that they picked up by a free agency as like Bertuzzi and Orlov. And so, you know, which I think kind of makes some sense. Um, I think he's still a pretty decent goalie. Um, he's not going to get overworked because again, he's in that timeshare. So I think his, his numbers, his ratios are still going to be very, uh, very reasonable. I say that was easily my best pick last season was, um, what was that one just from where I picked him and what he was able to do for me being really my, I, I think my team MVP. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you. Cause I picked him up in our last round. I've talked about this lots, but I got him in the last round of our draft last year. Um, and who knew, right. He's just been absolutely yeah. phenomenal. So uh, Bruce, what about you? What was your, your best value pick last season? If you can remember. Sam Sonoff. I got him in the 15th round. Mm, nice. And then I got, uh, I took, uh, Matt Murray in the 16th round to to complete the tandem. Mm. I was ecstatic that I got two Leaf goalies that late in the draft. I I was just surprised to see to see them drop because Leafs are going to win. So it's kind of like how people were surprised about, about Gorgiev in Colorado, like how well he did. Like you know that team's going to win, so you just mm. drag the goalie along, right? And that's how Sam I, how Sam Sloan off in Toronto wins. So I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. I, I I'll say that I was really surprised actually by Gorgiev Bruce. Like I, I was like, I, you knew they're going to win, but he had yeah. really good peripherals. And I, I think he surprised me anyway. I didn't think he was going to be a, a workhorse goaltender like he was last year. No, I sure didn't expect it either, but he, uh, he sure did it. So he's going, he's going a lot higher this year than he did last year. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's going top five in a lot of leagues this year. Yeah. Georgia. And I, I don't blame him. I mean, if Colorado wins a lot of games, he's going to start. He's, he might start close to 60 games this year. Yeah. Um, we consider Francois is injured again. and uh, uh, They said that they've been in the market for a backup goalie. So he could play a lot this year. And uh, yeah. you know, he could, he could be this year's Linus Allmark. I, I didn't even think he was that good of a goalie when he got traded to uh, Colorado from, from the Rangers, but yeah. Um, but just in terms of, of fantasy, I don't, I don't think he's going to have all Mark type ratios, but, um, but he could certainly rack up a lot of wins. He did last year. I think he was tied for wins with all Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Good season from him for sure. All yeah. right. And then on the flip side, uh, Bruce, I'll start with you here. What was the worst selection you made over the last season or two? Oh, that's easy. Jonathan Huberto last year. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I took him in the third round and yikes. <laughs> just Yikes. <laughs> Uh, that Ian, one's easy for me. Ian, what about you? Yeah, I had Huberdeau on one keeper team, so uh, that was I was that was a pick I made made before, and it was sort of a um, at the time was kind of a no brainer. But I would say my last year single season league, I think my worst pick was Victor Hedman, um, where I picked him. I believe um, it was in the second or the third round. Um, I'll have to double check here. Um, exactly where I, where I picked him here. Um, it was in the, um, Oh goodness me. It was in, it was 13th overall. Ugh, that was a bad pick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say, and I'm very, I know that when you win your, you could easily in your first round pick, um, you won't necessarily win your league. Um, but you could definitely lose it. Um, and I think that one, I think I was looking at the, the Roto rankings and thinking, Hey, this is a defenseman. He'd, he'd come off, a, um, he'd come off an 80 point season, I believe, um, the 85 point season, which is why he was, uh, he was ranked so high and he just, uh, he just crashed. I mean, at one point there was this discussion whether we should continue to, you know, keep him and in single season leagues partway through the year, he lost his, um, first power play to Sergachev and, uh, um, and he, he was slumping and fortunately he, he put it together. And, um, by the time he put it together, I tried to trade him. Um, I tried to get more at cider off, uh, um, off another team. And I was actually looking at games remaining and Tampa's games remaining were, uh, um, you know, were not as favorable as Detroit's. And unfortunately the guy I, I made the offer to, he, 
Um, he declined the offer. And not only that, I faced him in the final in the league and lost. So um, I managed to recover from my uh, my horrible, uh, my first round pick. Uh, maybe a lot had to do with Alinas Allmark. And, um, but it is possible if you completely whiff on that first round pick, it's entirely possible that you can still have some success in your fantasy league. So you know, don't, don't sweat it if, say, that, that first round pick if they're out for the season season ending injury then it, it is still possible for sure uh do you have any sort of early draft observations that you could maybe provide you know guys that are value that you're finding in the draft or players that are being overdrafted is there anything like that you can maybe provide us with um, I would say there's quite a few, I, I would say, look for guys that are falling because of injuries. Um, one that I had, one that I'd mentioned in a previous ramblings, actually, I'll come clean. It was Ehlers, but I was picking him. Um, it was quite late. It was, uh, after it was after like pick one fifty. Gotcha. or something like that, which I thought could, and, and that could still potentially pay off when you, uh, if you did pick him that late. Um, another one I, th- I could think of off the top of my head is a Philip Forsberg, who seems to be falling quite a bit in uh, in drafts. I mean, he's usually a top 100 guy, but he seems to be, uh, I think he's got an ADP of uh, quite a bit below that as, as well. So I mean, a lot of the guys that are injured, um, a lot of guys that had injuries last season, I think you could look at them and say, um, you know, is there a stat correction? I think one that I, I also found in round pick 200 in another draft or uh, um, somewhere around there just before was Josh Norris as well. He seemed to, he missed most of last season because of, uh, uh, because of the shoulder. So, I mean, though, I, th- I think just that's sort of a general strategy and, and just, you know, there, there's some names that you can look at ADP and think, oh, they should, should be higher. There's a few names, but I'd say look for guys that seem to be ranked lower by the system because i think it's when you're doing rankings it's easy just to sort by points and the guys who miss a whole bunch of games because of injury sometimes going to get forgotten about and they sort of fall down a little too far as a result so i think those players those are it's cole caulfield i think is is another one as a guy i lost sort of midway through the year last season zach warensky the same team i was describing Mm -hmm. i got snake bitten too because he um, he went out, he was out for the season early. Um, that's another guy I think that could, uh, could be falling quite a bit more than, um, where, where he could be. Even if you think Columbus is a tire fire right now, Wensky could still be pretty good. <laughs> I, I like Wensky a lot. I think he's got 20 goal potential and, and we've got him for about 62 points. I think Bruce, somewhere in there, 60 maybe, but, um, uh, I think so. Somewhere in that range, I mean, he's he could be a really helpful pick for sure. I, a guy like Max Pacioretty, like obviously that one concerns me a bit, but he's going 180th, I think, on average. Right? Like in that, you know, so if you can get him late like that, I think there's a lot of value potential. Um, and if it doesn't yeah. work out, then, you know, no harm, no foul. Um, mm-hmm. John Carlson is going close to the top 100, and, and he's a guy that could be a, a top five or top 10 defenseman this year, right, offensively. Um yeah, there's, there's, there seems like there's lots of value to, to be had here. Um, I did want to ask you too, what, like, where do you, where do you see Eric Carlson this year in, in Pittsburgh? Like, does he have a chance? I don't, I don't think he has a chance at another hundred point season, but you know, he's going to get a lot of power play one time. Um, and he's never had that level of talent around him on the power play. No, 100 points is an outlier. That was a one-time thing, I would say, and it would have surprised me. I think it surprised everyone that he was. Um, I mean, he got off to that incredible start and was like, "Hey, I was going to slow down," or there's going to be some sort of injury, and that never seemed to happen. Um, and I guess the optimist could think, "Hey, he's going to be even better in Pittsburgh." Oh, yeah, yeah, he could still be around a, a 70 point player that's about what i think he would be I mean, he is moving to a, a better team that's going to have a better power play uh or structured so i mean there there's that he still would be a valuable defenseman i think he could still be um a top 10 defenseman in, in fantasy and i say top 10 just because i think that his peripherals are not that great um in a pure scoring league i think he could be top five mm-hmm. um but yeah yeah, I think he's still there. There's still value, but you're not drafting him based on last season's point total. 
and I agree with you wholeheartedly on Cole Caulfield. And, and he's got dual eligibility, left wing, right wing eligible, which is great. Um, are you taking the over or under on 49 and a half goals for that guy? <laughs> Cole Caulfield? Cole Caulfield. Can he do it? Can he hit 50 uh, this year? Is that possible? 49 goals? No, I went an under on that. <laughs> I, yeah. I, you know what? It's, um, I think it was Matt Larkin that was talking about this, and he said basically – in 83 games with Martin St. Louis there, he's he's been at like a 48 goal pace or something. Like I, I, oh, okay. I'd, I'd have to fact check that, but I just, that's mm-hmm. a guy I think that could surprise a lot of people this year because yeah. he has dealt with some injuries. Um, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying 50 for sure, but I'm just curious if that's, if it's possible in his best season. I think 40 might be. 40 might be if he, uh, if he plays a full season he's most he's ever played in a season is 67 games. So, yeah. um, maybe 26 goals in 46 games last season, which wasn't bad. Um, shooting percentage may have been a bit high. He was taking over three shots per game. So, so yeah, I, I think there's great value. I think, um, you know, he's, he's somebody that in my mock drafts, I've picked at least once. Um, and after pick 100, and he, he sort of he, again, he fits that definition of a player who was injured last season and um, was falling because of it. And it's not a we're, we're not talking about a, a you know a Mark Stone type of injury that's going to linger from year to year. It's a injury that just you know he should be fully healed from, should be fine. So yeah. um, you know I, I don't like just throwing around he's going to score 50 goals because that's a <laughs> you know that you know, you know that that's that's like top tier goal goal status. I, I think I'd need to see more of a full season from him before I'd say, yeah, yeah write it, write him in for 50. Totally fair. I, I just thought it was an interesting point and I, I don't want to quote Matt because I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something to the effect okay. of over, you know, X number of games with St. Louis. He's been at that pace, I believe is what he said. Yeah. I, I didn't catch that. So I can't speak for that or anything, but, but anyway, yeah. really interesting. Just thought I'd bring it up. Um, I think that's pretty much it here for draft questions. Uh, Bruce, anything else from, from your end for draft questions? No, I think you covered it pretty well. All righty. Uh, then we got some mailbag questions here that we can just maybe rip through quickly, Ian, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, this is from Sasha Lagarde. Is fading goalies a viable strategy in a league that rewards volume for goalies, uh, points league with points for wins, saves, etc.? So, I mean, I think we probably adequately answered that one, but um, anything to add to that one? No, I mean, if it uh, rewards volume for goalies, then I think you've got to look at, you've got to target starters, um, guys that play lots lots of games like wins and saves. I think you've got to look at the, you know, who plays more games and not just wins, but who's who actually has a firm hold at, on the starting position. So I don't know if I would fade because I, I'd be careful about fading because if, if you fade them too far, then then all of those goalies that play a lot of, that you can count on to play a lot of games might be gone. And then you might be having to use two or three guys to fill the spot of one. So I, I be careful about that specifically again, how much you decide to implement zero G depends on your league as well. So it's again, not one size fits all for all leagues. If you have two go uh, two goaltending categories and three skater categories or you know, they're kind of evenly distributed then. Um, I, I don't think I'd use zero G, but if goaltending is really a, a minor part of your league, then uh, I'd say go for it. Okay. Um, of these four players in a points league that values goals, power play points, hits, and shots, how would you order these four players? Zach Hyman, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Evander Kane, and Evan Bouchard. Um, I think I would go Bouchard first. I like him on that power play. Uh, I think that the, him getting first unit power play minutes, we saw in the playoffs what he was able to do well over a point per game. Not to say that that's what's going to happen this year, but I think there's a potential for him to go um, bananas on there. So I think um, you can even make the argument that after uh, after McDavid and Dreisaitl, Bouchard might be the next best option, fantasy option on the Oilers when you compare him to other defensemen. Um, then I think it's a toss-up, really. It depends whether, if it's a pure scoring league, um, let's, go, let's see, goals, hits, shots. Okay, so hits and shots. Uh, then I think I would go Kane next, just because of that those those bangers categories or the hits, the 
uh, or the multi-category. Uh, then I think I would go with Nugent Hopkins. I haven't forgotten. He was a 100-point scorer last year. I don't think he gets there this year. I think he's just more of a 70-point, a maybe 80-point guy. Um, and then I think Hyman from there. I think that's how I would rank them. Okay, totally fair. Uh, speaking of bangers leagues, is Brady Kachuk that worthy in a banger league? Some projections or rankings have him as high as number two. Yeah, I think, um, I don't think I would draft him that high in a bangers league. I know we have our, uh, uh, bangers fantasy hockey that, uh, compile their top 100 roto rankings. Um, and I kind of question whether, I think you kind of still have to go with the scores, um, the really high scores of your top pick. I, I think Brady Kachuk is a very good score, but I wouldn't consider him an elite scorer. Um, he hits that level, absolutely. But if he hits 100 points, then I, I think you could think about it. I don't think he's quite there yet, though. Um, so I, I don't think I would, you know, Bangers League go top 10 or maybe even top five on him, I, I think. I'm not sure about going number two, but um, you could still go very high um, in a bangers league just because of the number of categories that he can fill for you. Yeah, I, I think that's, I would agree with that assessment. Top five or top 10, somewhere in that range. But yeah, number two is, that seems a little extreme, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, we have some Jets questions here. We've already talked about Nikolai Ehlers, so I, I don't think we need to spend any more time on that one. But can Josh Morrissey repeat his Norris Trophy caliber performance or was that another outlier? Like, how do you view Josh Morrissey? Uh, I have to be careful how I answer that question because I'm currently in a bidding war over Josh Morrissey. Um, <laughs> I think he's probably a little bit. Um, I think you drop a little bit in terms of points from last year. I tend to go back a little bit um, beyond a year to to make point projections. So I, I think you've kind of got a bit. Uh, we'll back on him a little bit. You also have to consider that the Jets have lost, a, they've lost Dubois, they've lost Wheeler. I know they brought in Velarde and um, I follow and um, it's not a, not a huge drop off, I suppose for them. Um, and it might go a little bit lower than that on, on Morrissey. I think he could, I, I think he could hit 70 again. Um, he, you have to keep in mind, he really slowed down in the final quarter of the, uh, of the season um, to less, you know, he was, he was under a point per game, even though he was going to push it. I think around 65 to 70 points might be a more reasonable expectation for, um, for Morrissey. Um, so I think he could, I don't know if he'd be Norris trophy caliber, but I think there's, um, still a very good defenseman. Okay. Uh, and then we've got another question here. We've actually talked about it on the show last night and, and I ran a poll, uh, on Twitter and on Instagram, um, so we kind of know what the, the the general public results are, but in a in a league where it's you have to pick two keepers, one of those keepers is going to be Leon Dreisaitl, the other is going to be either Jason Robertson or Ilya Sorokin. Twelve team head to head, uh, twelve team head to head league. So there's twelve categories for forwards and seven categories for goaltenders. Uh, which one are you keeping, Jason Robertson or Ilya Sorokin? I think I, I would go with Robertson on here just because I think you have to, I think you rely more on the score. I think the, you know, goalies again, year to year, things can change. Um, but I think a score, I think like, like Robertson, um, and, and I get varied opinions on Robertson, whether he's a first round pick or not. I, I think he is. I think he's, um, I, I think he's late top 10 um, or shortly after that in, I think that's that's fair for him. Uh, I just, you know, I, I realize Sorokin is a is a very good goalie, but I just don't think I would put that kind of stock. If you can only keep two players, then I, I have a hard time right now thinking that one of those two should be a goalie. I'm with you. Totally agree. I know. Yeah. I know Bruce does too. <laughs> Robertson all the way. All right, that does it for our mailbag questions. Then. Uh, Let's move on to top 10 centers and wingers. And, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on this, but um, Ian, it was basically just the top 10 for centers and the top 10 for wingers based on you know Yahoo ADP rankings. So I'm just going to read off the top 10 for centers and you kind of tell me if you agree with the ranking or not, how they're listed, uh, or if one guy should be ahead of the others. And then I just want to run through, run through some projections for each guy, talk a bit about them. So 
Starting with the centers, we've got Connor McDavid at number one, Leon Dreisel number two, Nathan McKinnon, Austin Matthews, Tage Thompson, Jack Hughes, Sidney Crosby, Rupe Hintz, Mika Zibanejad, and Elias Pettersson. All right. Um, I think that's fairly accurate. Um, the one that I might do, and uh, maybe especially in a pure scoring league, might I, I think I would put, I think Hughes has more, a little more upside than Tage Thompson. Um, I mean, I like I like Tage Thompson. Um, I, I think he's for real, but I think that there's more of a, if you look at the projections, I think you've got Hughes is a little bit higher. And I realize that Hughes doesn't have great um peripherals um thompson escapes me off the off the top of my head what he has for uh um for peripherals but i think i would you know when i'm going this high in players i think i I really look at scoring i think hughes has got that a little bit more um the rest of them i i mean i think that's pretty fair um i think or i hope i can put you might be able to put move petterson up to say number eight um, I think he's got the, I think he's got the potential for that, especially in a year where he's, you know, it's going to be a contract year. And I think there's a lot riding on his performance and that of the Canucks. Um, but that's, I could be quibbling a little bit on, on, on that one. I think they're all very, uh, closely re- ranked. I, I think that's, I'll, I'll say that's fairly accurate. I, I don't have any major issues with, uh, that top 10 ranking. Yeah, I I would sort of tend to agree with you on Pedersen. Like I think in a pure points league, he could he could outdo Zabanajad, Hints, and maybe even Sidney Crosby as well, right? Like, well, he put up 100 mm-hmm. points last year, and Crosby was at 92 or 93, right? So there's no reason to think he couldn't do it again. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it depends on what your league settings are and what you're looking at, but yeah, uh, he's not a strong peripherals guy. Though. No, that's yeah, that's the downside with him. So I think if you draft him, then I think you've got to look for peripherals from other players. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay, well, let's run through some uh, discussion on each of these players. I mean, Connor McDavid, it seems like we sort of gloss over this guy when it comes to fantasy because everyone just knows he's going to be the number one pick. He's going to put up 130-plus yeah. points, 140 points, whatever. Um, so it seems like we don't talk about him really that much, you know, just because if you don't have the first pick, you don't care. So, um, yeah. But Connor McDavid, I mean, he's got 381 points in 218 games played over the past three seasons. No one's close. Leon Dreisaitl sits second on that list um, with 322 total points in 216 games. Still 59 points back of, of the Oilers' captain. So it's it's pretty incredible, actually. Uh, he's McDavid is just that far ahead of the field. Um, we've got him here for 53 goals and 140 points for this upcoming season. I, I think there were some things... He, he shot a lot more last year, right? He was at 11.5 shots on goal per 60, so that made a big difference for him in terms of his... Uh, number of goals he scored and, and his 18 mm-hmm. plus uh, individual shooting percentage. Like there's lots of things working in his favor. Can he hit 60 again next year? Do you like over 140 points or where do you see his projection? Um, I mean, I think that's reasonable. 153 points is a lot. And this is, uh, you know, I, I, I can recall a season not so long ago when the leading score of the league did not reach hundred points. So, Obviously, things have changed. Uh, if you have that sort of player, I, mean, I, I think 140 is, is is reasonable. I think it's sort of hard to make a projection on McDavid because he's really reaching the stratosphere on on his points totals. But I mean, some of our, uh, um, but I mean, you know the, you know the sky's the limit, I guess, for him. So I think that's fair. Could he reach 60 again? Yeah, the shooting percentage was a bit high. Um, but I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's Connor McDavid, so it's hard to, uh, <laughs> predict what I think he'll hit 50 for sure. Yeah. Um, 60 might be, might be tough, but yeah, that's okay. I I'm with you there. I think there's some things I had some concerns about the Oilers in general, just like they're not going to have a 32 and a half percent power play next year. Right. It's it. We talked about last night and I've talked about it in, in previous episodes, I still think they're going to be the best power play in the league, but it's going to be at like 28 to 30%. That's my expectation. Yeah. Um, Leon Dreisaitl, this, and I say this as an Oilers fan, and, and Bruce knows how much I like Leon Dreisaitl, but I just <laughs> feel like he doesn't get enough respect around the league. There's a lot of people out there that will yell at me, you know, seven days out of the week that Nathan McKinnon's a better player, Austin Matthews is a better player. I just, I just don't believe it. Like Austin Matthews, yeah, sure, he shoots a ton. He's got a, he's probably the best pure goal scorer in, in the league right now. But Leon Dreisaitl, like he's, 
in terms of total points, he's been the second best player in the NHL for the past three, four seasons. It's not even close. Um, he scores 50 goals in his sleep, and he's probably the best passer and playmaker in the NHL right now, at least to my eyes. But where do you view dry settle? We've got him at 51 goals and 123 points. Yeah, I think that's that's reasonable, um, and in line with what he's uh, in line with what he's what he's produced in uh, in past seasons. I mean, last season, I think I uh, I got a little cute and was uh, I think arguing that a player like Matthews or um, McKinnon should be ranked ahead of Drysaitel, but Drysaitel just simply puts together the points. I mean, he's got four 100 plus point seasons, and uh, um, I think it's just really difficult right now to uh, you know to you know project him lower than number two. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> we'll go to Nathan McKinnon. So, you know what? I actually, in terms of fantasy, like Nathan McKinnon's fantastic, right? There's there's really not much not to like, but the problem is. He fi- like finally last year, 111 points in 71 games. His his pace is always great. The shot rate is is elite. I think he was second last year, Bruce, behind Pasternak, if I remember correctly. I believe so. Yes. Right. So he, like he's he's a great player, but he always seems to miss a handful of games, whether it's you know eight or ten or twelve, whatever. And it, and it's almost like clockwork. I and maybe I'm just recency bias, but. Um, you don't get a lot of full 82 game seasons out of Nathan McKinnon. Maybe it doesn't matter. What do you think? And again, our projection is 42 goals and 115 points. Yeah, I think you have to factor in the time loss due to injuries. I mean, he hasn't played his games played 71, 65. I guess he had the full, uh, no, wait, that was uh, 56 games. So he missed some time in the, uh, uh, the COVID shortened season. Um, I mean, before that he was, he was fairly healthy, but you have to take into account a player's track record. So I think that's why he, he falls a bit. I think he has the potential um, in over a full 82 game season. I think he has the potential to outscore dry cycle, but we just haven't been able to count on that with McKinnon. All right. Uh, Austin Matthews. I think this guy's due for a big bounce back season. I think he shot at 12.2%. That was, I think, a career low for him, actually. So um, dealt with some wrist injuries. Uh, just a bit of a down year for, for his standards. 40 goals and 85 points is still a fantastic season. But And that was in 74 games. Um, is This this guy's probably a real threat to outside of McDavid. Probably the next best option for the, the Rocket Richard Trophy. I think so, yeah, and I think he could make another run at 50, uh, quite honestly. Um, there are a few games lost due to injury as well, kind of like McKinnon. Um, we kind of underperformed last year. I thought he would uh, perform better than, than he did, but I still wouldn't rule him out for 50 goals. He um, he can take over 300 shots per game. Um, <clears throat> the Leafs using the right line combinations. You know, I, I think there's... Uh, um, I, I think he's fair, fairly ranked where where he is, but um, again, if things go right, he he, he could move. Um, he could easily move up in the center rankings. I, I like him a lot for this season. I, I like the addition of Tyler Pertuzzi. I think that's a really nice add for them on that. Like to me, that's an upgrade over a guy like Michael Bunting or or some of the other guys they've tried on the left side there. Um, I, we, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and we I think for puck retrieval, like like Pertuzzi's just a mm-hmm. dog on a bone, right? So I think he's going to help yeah. them. You know some added pressure on the four check and in, in the offensive zone. Um, we've got a Matthews projected. He's an underrated his, player Bertuzzi, I think. He's, yeah. 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 You know, yeah, I, he's I was, impressed me when I've seen him. I was really surprised this summer, how many people were kind of just lukewarm on the Bertuzzi signing. Like I, I thought mm-hmm. there's a lot more to give from that player. He's dealt with some injuries and stuff, but yeah, he's never played with Matthews and Marner. So that should be really interesting to watch. I think Leaf fans will like him, even though he might not be there for a long time since he's only signed for a year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 62 goals and 100 points for Matthews. You're taking the over-under. Uh, sorry, say that again. Uh, 62 goals, 100 points. I would take. I would definitely take the under on the goals. Uh, again, I think 50 is very reachable. 100 points, uh, I think I would go a little bit under, but not too much. Okay. Uh, Tage Thompson, he's got Buffalo fans saying Eichel who? Uh, yeah. our, our projection for him is 46 goals and 92 points. I, I think this is a guy that could hit 50 and a hundred if all goes well for him, but what do you think? 
Yeah, um, I, I mean, certainly he got off to that roaring start where he was uh, he was at the top of the league. I mean, he did kind of peter out a little bit as the uh, as the season went on. He finished with just 12 points in his last 17 games. So I think there's a bit of a concern in terms of uh, whether he can whether that's sustainable or he repeat it. That's kind of why I had a guy like Hughes ranked a bit higher than Thompson. I think that's why I would go. Um, go ahead with them there but at the same time buffalo is a team they are on the rise they've got um they're gonna have some good talent to uh do, to surround him so um so yeah i think that uh um 46 i i'd say that's you know 90 points is probably probably reachable again um I, I might just bet the under just because i'm i i might maybe i'm not as big on thompson as, as some others but just because he doesn't have that track record yet but uh but but i could see it okay totally fair uh this next guy bruce and i are right there with you in terms of uh ranking him ahead of thompson because we've got him for 47 goals and 103 points there's there's a lot to like about the new jersey devils for next year um yeah. do you like the projection 47 goals 103 points and and uh are you bullish on the devils for next season yeah i think so i think that's reasonable i think he could I think he could very well hit 100 points. He hit 99 in 78 games. Um, he had some injury trouble the year before. He's obviously proven that he can hit over uh, over a point per game. Uh, this is uh, you know this this is not your uh, your father's New Jersey Devils. This is a Devils team that's <laughs> going to be high octane. Uh, that's going to be fun to watch. They're not already. And uh, yeah, I could I could totally see he shoots the puck a lot over all over. Uh, 300 shots last year so um, yeah I yeah I, I easily project close to 50 goals and 100 points for uh, um, for Jack Hughes all right and then next up we got Sidney Crosby I don't know there's just sort of like a, a different feeling with this team I think just bringing in Carlson and, and they were really disappointed with the way that the season finished a couple of players said they've never seen Crosby so upset at the end of a season mm-hmm. um, he was he took it personally I thought it was terrible. They couldn't beat Chicago and Columbus to get to yeah. get in the playoffs by one point. It was absolutely brutal. Um, mm-hmm. But I, yeah. I, Crosby's been very consistent. He's been the model of consistency, actually, over the past few seasons. And his shot rate has continued to go up over the past mm-hmm. four seasons. So, yeah. uh, you know, elite-level players... like have his points. And, yeah, right. So we've got him for 34 goals and 92 points this season. Uh, and, and two at an ADP of 19 right now. He might be a bit higher now, but uh, I, I like Crosby for next year. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I might go a little bit under as far as the point projections, but I kind of feel like we take Sidney Crosby for granted in, uh, in fantasy. Like we, uh, we list off these top options and kind of forget that Crosby is still here. I mean, granted <laughs> he's aging a bit. He's 36 now, um, keeps himself in, uh, in peak health. So, um, it takes, takes the game of hockey very seriously. So, this I, I think this is a player that I think once all those kind of top tier centers are gone, I think you could easily look at a Crosby and be just fine. Um, he's had his injury troubles uh, throughout his career at, at various points, which is something you have to be concerned about. And that might be a reason why you don't rank him as uh, um, as as top tier. But um, I've kind of. You know, it's kind of funny when we're talking about lot um, mock drafts here, and sort of that first run of you know top five goalies that are going in the late second round. That that run of goalies I found is kind of right after guys like Crosby and Mitch Marner are getting picked. So it's kind of like that's kind of where the I'd say that's kind of where that tier ends. I mean, it, you know, McDavid obviously is in a, in a class of his own, but sort of that uh, the centers we've discussed so far is kind of. I'd say Crosby is sort of the the last one in that tier before you start getting into, um, I, I'd say the final three options on that list or hence Zabana, Jad, Pedersen are part of the next tier. And there may be some other centers that you could, you could lump in there with them as well. Yeah. And I think like, I would even maybe put Zabana, Jad and Pedersen ahead of Hints. Like Hints is, is great, but our projection for him is 33 goals and 73 points. So, Mm-hmm. I don't know if his ceiling is quite as high as a guy like and maybe Zabanajad, but Pedersen, I, I I'm pretty high on that guy for next year. So, um, hints though, playing on a wagon in Dallas, do you like him for seventy three plus points? Oh yeah, yeah, I think that uh, I think that's easily attainable um, for that 
uh, that high. I, I think I'd go over on, on over that on, on Rupe Hintz. If that top line of Hintz, Pavelski, and Jason Robertson, if they, they stick together, then I think that's uh, they've got a lot um, going. I think that's uh, um, Rupe Hintz, I think, is uh, – his point per game. I think he's gotten over some injury troubles that he had early, uh, early in his career. Um, he's proven that he can be around the point per game mark over the past three seasons. So I, I think I like, um, I, I like it. I like the over on 33 goals and 73 points for hints. Okay. Uh, is father time finally going to catch up with Joe Pavelski? Um, maybe a little bit. Um, although I think with the role he plays as sort of a, a tip in type of uh, goal score. I don't think because it's taxing on the body is uh, um, as it might, you know, as, as if he had to sort of be relied on more for his speed. I mean, they've got the other, you know, the, the speed guy, like the, you know, the hints and the, the Jason Roberts and the younger players. And I think the playing on that line, I think is still good for his goal total. Like having said that you have to account for that drop off. Sometime he is, he is 40 years old, so that could happen any year now, I guess. If he gets moved off that line, then that's a uh, um, that could be a bit of a problem for his uh, um, for his scoring as well. Yeah, we've got him at 28 goals and 68 points is our projection for him. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then Zabanajad, 37 goals, 92 points. I mean, he's playing on one of the best best teams and, and he's got a pretty, I think they're seventh last year on the power play. Um, so again, solid production there. Yeah. I've got Zabana Jad in one of my leagues and counted on him for a few years. I think that's, uh, um, that seems fair. Something just under 40, um, just under 40 goals and uh, uh, maybe close to 90 points. That seems fair. The Rangers are going to be strong offensively. I think um, point per point per game player. Um, can get a little hot and cold at, at times, as it happened uh, when he got off to a slow start one year, and then was suddenly putting up uh, um, six game, six point games with it seemed like regularity. So, <laughs> um, but he's uh, you know all in all that works out to be being fairly uh, um, fairly consistent um, with uh, with Zabana Jad, and I'd say he's definitely. We talked about that tier that ends with Crosby. I think that next tier. Um, definitely includes Zabana Jad um, at or near the top of the list. All right. And then Elias Patterson, who you had mentioned is in a contract year, should have a good season. 38 goals and 88 points. Are you taking the over or the under? Uh, maybe it's the Canucks fan in me, but I'm taking the over on that. Um, again, contract year, he's gotten to 100 before. Uh, we've seen what he can do. Um, seen what he can do. Um, I mean, prior to that, he had not reached 70 points in a season, but he'd had some injury problems. Um, he'd had some, um, the Canucks, as you know, haven't always been that great. So, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of affected him, but we've kind of seen what, you know, you'd seen glimpses of what he was capable of prior to that. So I, I don't see any, I mean, getting to 102 points last season. I don't see much of a drop off, if any, for uh, EP 40. Okay, perfect. Uh, does he resign in in Vancouver? What's that? D- does Patterson resign with the Vancouver Canucks? Oh, man, the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a chance he could sign, even if they miss the playoffs again. If they show enough, um, you know, if there aren't sort of the bad vibes that they've had in previous seasons, I think there's a bit more stability there with uh, with Talkit as the coach. Um, and they're really emphasizing structure now, like just kind of, um, it got, might, might be a slap in the face to Bruce Boudreaux, but at any rate, that's kind of, honestly, that's what the Canucks have kind of needed is a bit of, a, a bit of structure. So, and they've improved defensively. So I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs, but, um, but at least if they can show something, if they can show them be competitive, if they can show that they're not going to, you know, uh, the, the defense the penalty killing is going to be paper thin. Then I, I think he could, he could resign. It might take, it's going to take some money. Um, uh, might take some creative cap maneuvering because a lot of the Canucks problems are self-inflicted due to their cap, uh, their mishandling of the salary cap. So, um, I, I, I think, I think he will. Um, uh, that's not a strong, yes, he will, but, um, 
maybe sort of a 60-40 that, yes, he will. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the top 10 wingers here then. So, again, I'll just rattle off this list, and you can tell me, excuse me, if uh, if anyone sticks out as, as good or bad. Uh, David Pasternak, Matthew Kachuk, Nikita Kucherov, Jason Robertson, Miko Rantanen, Brady Kachuk, Kirill Kaprizov, Mitch Marner, Alex Ovechkin, and William Nylander. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I think that's a fairly accurate uh, set of tiers. I might put Kachuk over Pasternak, and that's even me being a um, a Pasternak keeper guy. Um, I kind of wonder whether Bergeron retiring is going to have an impact. Pasternak still a very uh, reliable player. I think that's uh, you know he could still reach close to 50 goals again. Um, so that's we've got to watch out for that. I think. Uh, Kachuk obviously had the broken sternum at the during the Stanley Cup final. I think he's recovered from that. Um, take their word, assuming that he is. I think he could be the number one ranked um, winger, especially in a in a bangers format who takes the shots on goal. Uh, there's the potential for the hits, although I don't really see him rack up the hits like Brady does. Uh, so we've got to be careful to, to assume that he's going to be a, a you know, he, he's going to be dominant in a bangers league because he's a Chuck, but, um, but I think there's enough scoring there. Um, I mean, after that Kucherov, um, you kind of get a hundred points. Yeah. Robertson, uh, you might get close to 50 goals. Rantanen, I, I like, cause he could get close to 50 goals again as well. Uh, you got Brady Kachuk again. Where you rank him depends on his uh, where you put um, whether your league is a is a bangers league or what your categories are. Kapril Kaprizov, I think you're kind of you've kind of forgotten about a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I'm not. I don't mean you forgotten, but I mean I think he's getting a little bit forgotten about just because he did miss some time because of injury. So I think you could probably you could make an argument where you could bump him up a little bit, especially in a league that emphasizes scoring. I think I might put him ahead of a Kachuk. Um, if you're talking a league that's mostly scoring, uh, Marner, yeah, Ovechkin, yeah, you know, Ovechkin's an interesting one because, again, age. When does age sort of kick in with him? He's uh, again in a bangers league, hits, shots. He's still extremely good, so you could put him higher in a bangers league. It's just, uh, you know he just uh, he's a freak if he's uh, contributing that much in in a bangers league. Uh, Nylander might be sort of part of that next. That might be where that next year starts. <laughs> um, yeah, especially if you put stock into that third line center thing in Toronto. But I just um, maybe is a you know, very very good player might be in that you know, sort of I guess a top thirty. Um, but that might be where sort of that next tier begins, I guess. All right. And, and I'll just, uh, Bruce, any, any thoughts on, on this top 10 here? Where, where do you kind of see these guys? Uh, for me. So when I look at this, I, well, I would put Jason Robertson up near the top, same with Renson and I would move them up closer to the top. Like Ian said, bangers league. Like I think Brady would go. You, I would take him high. I would probably consider taking him in the first round, possibly. The fact that I, if I hear Kaprizov is dropping, I would in I would really like that because I also really like him as well. So, but I tend I think this year I might tend to lean to go with the younger guys over the older guys. I I don't know. It just seems to be the way I'm leaning right now. I, I'm with you. I think a guy like Ovechkin. I wonder, like he is up there in age, and so he is incredibly value in a bangers league format, but at what point does he stop hitting and just want to score goals and, and uh, you know, set that new goal scoring record? Like it shouldn't say stop hitting, but you know, things start to, things start to ache when you're 37. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I would agree too on Rantanen. Like I actually like him better than both Jason Robertson and Nikita Kucherov for next year. Um, I think if, if McKinnon is healthy for the majority of next season, I think 55 goals and 100 points uh, should be easily attainable for Miko Rantanen. He what he did last year, Absolutely. he largely did without McKinnon. And I so for me, like mm-hmm. that's a guy. And again, right wing eligible, where there's a bit of scarcity on that side. Um, yep. To me, that's that's super valuable. Mm-hmm. David Pasternak, I agree with yeah. your assessment too, Ian. I think he. I, I have concerns about him, and especially an ADP of 3.6. 
I, I just won't draft Pasternak this year that high. I don't think he's going to mm. potentially like live up to that value. So um, that's kind of how I'd assess those ones. We're kind of, we're getting to the end of our time here, Ian, but I, I can I just really quickly, do you want to go through an over under on the projections with us? Uh, I'll just, I'll just read them off. You tell me over under. So sure. Okay. David Pasternak, 51 goals, 98 points. Um, I think I would go, that's a good, I, I'd say on the goals, I would go under points. I'm, I think I'd be close to that on, on point. I mean, maybe a bit under, as I say, under on both. Okay. Uh, Matthew Kachuk, 40 goals, 112 points. Uh, I think we could go over on the goals. Um, and maybe even, uh, 112 points. That's uh, I might go a bit under on the points as well, even though I like him as a um, as a as a scorer. Um, I, he's a top rank, but I mean that that might be more of a really hundred. It might be 105 points or something like that. Sure. Uh, Nikita, yeah. Nikita Kucherov, 39 goals, 109 points. Uh, probably should go under because I I that still kind of put Kucherov behind. Uh, Kachuk, not sure about Pasternak. Um, I think Pasternak, the fact that he scores a few more goals than Kucherov, I think maybe puts gives him the upper hand on Kucherov. So I'd say under on the points. And as for the uh, as for the goals, as for goals, I think I might go a bit under on the goals as well. All right, uh, Jason Robertson, fifty goals, ninety eight points. Um. Uh, being a bit conservative with my point projections here. This is a, I think 50 goals is, I think is, is reasonable. I had a hard time just saying this guy's going to score 50 goals. I might go a bit under uh, points wise, 98 points. I, I think he could go, I think he potentially could go over that. The 109 last year and he plays on the uh, on wing and he proven he's actually, um, he actually piled up some assists last year. So I, I think he could actually go a bit over on the, on the points. Okay, uh, Miko Ranson, we've got at forty-five goals and hundred points. I'm um, gonna say over on the goals. I I think he could push close for fifty, a um, hundred points. Could he get to a hundred points? Ranton and go hundred points. I think I was close to hundred points on him again. He has to stay healthy. That's that's the thing. So, um, I think I'm gonna go over on the goals, but under on the points. All right, uh, Brady Kachuk. By a small margin. Sure. Okay. Uh, Brady Kachuk, 35 goals, 84 points. Mm. Let's see. I would, for goals, it seems reasonable. I might go a bit under on the goals. I mean, it takes a lot of shots, though. That's that's a thing, which is going to result in some goals. Um, maybe... You know what? I'm going to go a little bit. I'm going to go over a bit on Kachuk here. Um, I think he could get. To, I think he could get to 90 points, and I think he could get to 40 goals. I, th- I think he has that trajectory right now. Um, again, like I said, I don't think he's quite the score as the uh, as the options above him, but um, but I think I'd, I might go a little bit over. All right, uh, Kirill Kaprizov, 47 goals and 100 points. Um, like those projections, um, uh, maybe a bit under on the goals, maybe a bit over on the points. Okay. Uh, Mitch Marner, 32 goals, 100 points. That seems fair as well. Um, I'm there on the one. I think I would go, I think we reached a hundred points. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, which I think he could, uh, that's again, that's a good projection. Um, I'll go a little bit, I'll go a little bit under on the points just because we haven't seen him get to hundred points yet. And I think I might go a bit over on the goals though. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Ovechkin, 48 goals, 83 points. Um, yeah, I think, I think the goal 48 points might be a little high. Um, in terms of goals, points, it seems fair for points, maybe a little bit under just because I think maybe, uh, maybe father time starts to catch up to him a little bit here. 
Okay. So these are your projections, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, they seem like good. These are good projections, actually. I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not having any. I'll just say that even though you're looking for me to the over and under on these, I, I don't have any real issues with these projections. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, that means a lot coming from Ian Gooding, Bruce. All right. <laughs> really. All right. The last guy here, William Nylander, 39 goals, 85 points. Yeah, goals. Uh, again, seems reasonable. He's in a contract year. One of the things is, is, uh, things we should mention here is he's also in a contract year. And as we've seen from Nylander, he is, um, he will hold out to get that contract. So, um, I think I maybe go a little bit under, um, if there's anything to this number three center thing, I, I'm not putting a ton of stock into it in, in the beginning, but, um, let's say that there is, I might do a smidgen under for each of those. That's totally fair. Yeah. Obviously when we did the projection, um, we, we didn't have any new information to work with, uh, you mm-hmm. know, as premature as it may be here in, uh, training camp, but Okay, there you go. There you have it. Uh, Ian, yeah. we're, I, I blew past our, our hour time limit that I was shooting for, so thank you very much for <laughs> uh, for being generous with your time. Really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, I know Bruce and I are, well, actually all the hacks, we're really looking forward to having you on the show uh, on Wednesdays as well as part of that regular rotation. Definitely. So uh, yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun, and I think it's going to be even more fun when we have just new, exciting, fun things happening in season. Uh, as opposed to just doing some projections and talking about draft strategies. So uh, that'll be really for good. For sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, and just for our listeners, I'm sure they know where to find you, but in case not, uh, where should they go look to find your your content? Uh, Dauber Hockey uh, weekends, uh, Saturday and Sunday ramblings. Um, every other Friday, I uh, split Fridays with Mike Clifford. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, um, underscore Ian, or pardon me, at Ian underscore Gooding is where you can find me on Twitter. Perfect. And I appreciate that you're still calling it Twitter, not X. <laughs> I just can't. I, I can't call it X. It's always been Twitter to me. It's just, it's, yeah. X just sounds weird, but I don't know. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, Elon Musk, I think, has got further changes planned for this, but we'll see. Uh, ho- hopefully not too drastic, but. Um, yeah. And then, of course, if you want to find us, go check us out on Twitter at FHX and fantasyhockeyhacks.com. You can also find uh, some of our content this season over at heavyhockey.com. Lots of good stuff there. We're going to live stream our shows on Wednesdays onto the YouTube channel, so go check that out and make sure you subscribe. Uh, That's going to do it for another week. Bruce, thanks for being here. Ian, thank you again. We will talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. You bet. Good night. Take care.